this morning and read 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting here in verse 8. He says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the, woman, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Verse 11, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. It seems in the church we have the same problem coming in many, many faces. And we've had it for so many years, over and over again, so many things. All come down to this one basic principle. How should we worship and serve God? How should we accomplish these things? In what way should we handle the Lord's services or whatever the case might be? And the answer always needs to come from the same source. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, he says, But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Headed back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. American culture does not determine how God is worshipped. And we're going to deal with that specifically today. American culture does not determine how God is worshipped when God defines how He would like to be worshipped. We don't change what God designs just because we think it should be done differently or because the American citizens think it should be done differently or because the world votes on it and decides that this is how it should be done. God is the author of the Bible and He authors His words in relation to how He should be worshipped. And if we want to worship Him, we worship Him in spirit and in truth or we do not worship Him at all. If we do anything other than worship Him in spirit and in truth, we're not worshiping Him, we're worshiping ourselves. So when God designates, when God decides, when God puts in how a person or how He should be worshipped, we need to do it not only how He wants to be worshipped, but in exactly the manner that He describes. There are many arguments against the way the Bible portrays God being worshipped and the way that the gender roles play into that. And I'm sure many of us have heard arguments exactly for that case. And the first and foremost one I hear is that we're all chauvinist pigs. Or more precisely, they argue that Paul was a chauvinist pig. But if you really look at Scripture, and you want to remain consistent, you have to look through it. God chose men to be leaders. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 you notice the language there. It was not good that man should be alone, and God created a helper comparable to him, or a helpmeet. That is, that He created another individual that was conducive to Him getting His job done. That they worked t together, and that they were comparable. You can't have two gears that don't line up work in any fashion. It doesn't work. If they don't line up, if they are not the same size teeth, if they are not comparable to one another, they will not get anything done. They will merely spin individually. Or not spin at all. And he says there in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, this is one of the arguments for women not teaching. Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgressions. Paul is not making an argument from a chauvinistic perspective, at least a personal chauvinistic perspective, because God has determined these things from the get-go. A helper comparable to Him. And there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul draws on creation of man to begin with. To determine the order of things and how things should run. Noticing that second verse there, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Genesis 3 and verse 16, 
Part of the condemnation for Eve was not only the pain of childbearing, but also that her desire would be for her husband, he says, <coughs> excuse me, and that he should rule over her. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul writes, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And that man and woman there could very easily be, because of the way the Greek works, it could talk about husbands and wives there. The, the, the leader or the head of the wife is her husband. Just as the head of any husband needs to be Christ. And the head of Christ is always God. And so there is this delineation of responsibility. And there is an establishment, as he has done so earlier, with, with this leadership or responsibility. Notice number C there, or letter C there. The, in the Old Testament, they're called patriarchs, not matriarchs. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. That God makes those covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And while interstrewn in the Old Testament, you do have a few women leaders. Deborah comes to mind in particular. It seems from the text that it comes more from a lack of responsibility on the men, and especially Balaam, that he was not serving as he needed to. Notice when Jesus chooses apostles, he chooses twelve men to serve as the capacity of the leaders of all the congregations, to be the responsible individuals who would lead this new age of, uh, of church, uh, of the, the Lord's kingdom. There we go. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, when the first deacons are established, he says, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good, repu uh, of good repute or good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Consistency even into congregational leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 and verse 12. Titus chapter 1 and verse 6. That deacons and elders are the husbands of one wife. Now women have a difficult time managing that responsibility or that quality. And ultimately when a person argues that Paul's chauvinism affected his writings, they actually argue against the inspiration of the scriptures. Whether they realize that or not, that's precisely what they're doing. First, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul writes that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And if we cannot trust parts of that inspiration, then we cannot be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. But more precisely, 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is it of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're going to argue that Paul is chauvinistic, his chauvinism cannot translate into the Bible. Or the Bible is not inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. Because even Peter, another apostle of Jesus Christ, says that that's simply not the case. That holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They didn't speak on their own accord. They wrote these things because they were moved by the Holy Spirit to do so. And if you argue against Paul's chauvinism, or, or for Paul's chauvinism, that it affected his writings, you have to discredit the entire Bible. Now, the fact that men are appointed leaders does not diminish the role and the wonderment that women can be to congregations and to the church abroad. That is oftentimes the problem that we have a lack of perspective. If you have two individuals, or if you have a business, say you, you own a restaurant, and you establish being the manager, now we, know, we all know who the manager is, being Christ or God in this perspective, and you decide that this one individual is going to be is going to wait tables and this other individual is going to cook the food both of them are interdependent the one waiting tables cannot put food out unless the cook cooks it and the cook cannot cook food unless the one waiting tables takes orders 
They are interdependent. They are comparable to one another. And they are both needed in order to, for, for the, the good of that restaurant to run. Being or waiting tables does not make you less than cooking food, and cooking food does not make you less than waiting tables. It's simply the job description given by the manager. If we could only have that perspective in the Lord's church, we discredit the role of women in the Lord's body because they are not leaders. And that is shameful. We pretend sometimes, or people who argue against this pretend that the role that God gave women makes women less. Have you seen a man follow? It is hard to follow, I know. I know that it's difficult sometimes reading through the Scriptures and wanting to do my own thing and knowing that Christ is the head, that He is the leader, and He is in ultimately the way a ruler over me. And I know that it is not easy to submit yourself to another. And yet women are not in that way weaker because they submit. In fact, the way the Bible describes them, Ephesians chapter 5, the relationship between especially a husband and his wife, but women in general... Verse 22, he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. That's, that's 1 Corinthians 11.3 right there. But verse 24, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be, uh, be to their own husbands in everything. But then in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. He continues into that to talk about the relationship between a husband and his wife in the same perspective that Christ loved the church, that He would give Himself for her. The way the Bible describes woman is not as a less significant individual. Not as a worthless person who has no value to the congregation, but as a beloved companion. A person that God considered there in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it wasn't good for man to be alone. So God blessed man with one of the greatest gifts, woman. That each man would have a wife comparable to him. That she would assist him in his role. And they would each further their own causes. That they would both pursue their own roles in this. And God would delineate how that relationship would work. And the funny thing about it, it works. It works. Until we change our perspective and we consider women a second class citizen and we decide that the role of woman is not enough for woman, it works. But all that's really happened is that we've lost perspective. The woman's role is important. Notice. 1 Timothy 3, 2, 12, and Titus 1, 6. I cannot speak for God in respect to why He demands that the elder be the husband of one wife. But He demands it. And so it is obviously necessary that that be the case. That there be that relationship. And whether it, might, whether it is for the support and the edification of the man, for the help that she can be to him, or whatever service she can provide to the husband in order to help him do his work as an elder, it is required. Which means that she is important to that work. Which also means that no elder stands on his own. None of the work he does is his own. It is in a way a joint effort. So really, ultimately, our problem is not that women are less significant, that they're inferior, that they're lesser than men because they're not leaders. It's merely that their role is different. Galatians chapter 3, moving on. Point number 2, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. And it reads, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so, as he says that, ironically enough, the chauvinist Paul says that. And there are with this verse, they say men and women are made equal or one in Christ. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. That was not just. It's in the same respect that he's talking Galatians 3, 28. That God shows no partiality. But something we have to remember is that we're equal or we're one in what way? In what way are we all equal or one? Is that that we are no longer separated by any means? That we no longer have a division of labor, that we no longer have different responsibilities and different roles to play? Or is it equality or oneness in a different way? Galatians chapter 3, we're going to read 28 again. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29 though, continuing... And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The equality comes in the fact that we all have access to heaven through Christ's blood. That God shows no partiality in that way, or no favor towards men over women, that He would say, well, men are going into the kingdom, but women aren't allowed. We all have access to becoming children of Abraham, seeds of Abraham, and heirs according to the promise, because of that oneness, that we're one in that way. That we can all become members of the Lord's body, as many as submit to be baptized for the remission of their sins and repent of the sins that they've committed, confessing Christ and believing in that one faith that was once for all delivered. That we can all do that, and we there is no respect of persons in that way. But if you continue, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, verse Acts chapter 10, verse 34. But then in verse 35 he says, he con- continues, But in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. We all, no matter if you're Greek or you're barbarians or you're Scythians Sith- or you're from America, whether you're from Indiana or Ohio or you're from Jerusalem, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter who you are, Everyone in every nation has the same, the same ability to be accepted by God. Because the acceptance from God does not matter where you live or what gender you are, whether you're white, black, or yellow or red. All that matters, he says, in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. That is the equality that we all share. Does that change the relationship that we have with one another? No, notice notice there he also includes in Galatians 3.28, Jews or Greeks, we're cool with that. That middle wall of separation from the book of Hebrews has been abolished, it's been destroyed, so that they are both one now in Christ. And then he ends with males or females, but that middle one causes pause, doesn't it? That there's neither slave nor free, and if... That oneness that they have, then slaves are no longer slaves and freemen are no longer freemen. They're both equals. There's no difference between slaves and free if the difference between males and females have been eliminated. And yet Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5, he says... Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as to Christ. Not with eye service as man pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Now, if you stop right there, slaves have not stopped being slaves. They still have a responsibility to their masters, and yea, more of a responsibility to their masters because they have a master above that master. And he says that they should treat their master in regard to work and service. As if he were working for God, working for the Lord Himself. He says, verse 8, and recognize this again, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. There's that relationship. There's that oneness that whether you're a slave or a free man, not only do you have the same access to heaven through Christ's blood, not only do you have the same ability to be accepted by Him, but he says that you have the same ability to lay your treasures up in heaven. As a free man, whether you're, even if you're slave, 
Notice also, Paul does not tell Philemon, the book of Philemon, really it's like a postcard to Philemon, it's very short. But Paul does not tell Philemon to release Onesimus. Onesimus is Philemon's servant, he's his slave. And he has a responsibility, Onesimus has a responsibility to Philemon, but Onesimus runs away. And he's not a Christian at the time, but when he runs away, he ends up coming to Christ with Paul. He finds Paul along the way, I don't know how that worked. And Paul even speculates that it may very well have been for his betterment that he ran away at the time. Because he came to Christ outside of his relationship to Philemon. That slave-master relationship. And if people become one in Christ, and those earthly relationships are eliminated, right? there's no longer slave or free, then Paul should have written to Philemon, the owner of Onesimus, to say, you are one in Christ now. You have to release Philemon. He's, or Onesimus. He's no longer your slave because you're all one. There's no longer slave or free. He doesn't do that. He actually sends Onesimus back. And while he tells Philemon that he will cover whatever damages were caused, that is to say, there was usually a charge, more time added to the sentence, because that's what slavery was at the time. It wasn't an eternal slavery like what we think of in America. It was for a specific amount of time, for damages caused. Uh, if, if you killed their ox, then you had to pay for that ox. And if you couldn't pay, then you served them a number of years. Or perhaps it was for some other reason. But there was a specific amount of time, and when a slave ran away, time was added to that time to cover the damages of him having to pursue his servant. And Paul says, I will cover that. Don't worry about that. And yet he still sends Onesimus back. And he still makes it very clear that Onesimus is still a servant or a slave of Philemon, though they're both Christians now. Because the earthly roles that each one plays does not change. Our access to heaven, our relationship with God, our ability to lay up treasures, that's what changes. That we all have that same ability. There is no, God is no respecter of persons. He shows no partiality. We are all one in Christ in the way that we all have access to the Almighty. We can all pray to the same Lord. And while that relationship should change as he goes on there in Ephesians chapter 6, talking not only about slaves to their masters, but masters to their servants, that they wouldn't beat them and be merciless with them, while that relationship does change because they become Christians, it doesn't eliminate the servanthood that's involved there. The fact that one is a master and one is a servant, this is by no means to compare the man and his wife. Just merely to compare the earthly relationships and how they are maintained even through becoming Christians. We all have the same access to Christ, and that's his point. It's not about making one superior and one inferior. It's not making man better than woman, because it's simply not the case. Both are effective vessels in God's sight when they fulfill their roles. When they fulfill their roles. And a man might not want to be a leader, and yet if he does not lead his own household, he is not well-pleasing in God's sight. And the same goes for a woman in regard to her role. We might not like the hand we're dealt, but we play the hand the best we can. Notice also here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So what's the whole point here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 12, but then on into verse 15? Really the point is here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. I want us to read it again, and I want us to notice the qualifiers that are used. The qualifiers that are used. I think you'll understand as I go on. Okay, verse 8. I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Wrath and doubting are distractions to the proceedings that are going on. If a man prays and he is not fervent in his prayer and he is not effective in his praying and he has all kinds of doubt in regard to the things that he is praying, is he going to effectively lead the, men, the people's minds in that prayer? Or will he be a distraction? If he begins to pray for the condemnation of others... If he voices his wrath towards another brother or whatever the case might be, that is very much a distraction to the proceedings that are going on. 
And so the first point you see here in verse 8 is that men need to pray everywhere without the distraction of wrath and doubting. Look at verse 9. In like manner also that the, woman, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Now if you stop right there, women are not to distract from the proceedings by their dress. The funny thing about this is this is oftentimes used in regard to too little dress, but not once in the New Testament does it describe too little dress. Every time it describes modesty, it describes it as too much dress. Now that very well might be because too little dress is obviously an issue. But more precisely, notice that he's making an issue of the modesty. And the word modesty means not standing out. It means not standing out. So when you're being immodest, whether it's too little clothing or too much clothing, you're standing out. And he says, quit doing it. Notice his description of this immodesty. <clears throat> not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but instead with a, uh, which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. He says, women should not distract with their outward appearance. That's his whole point here. Women should not distract with their outward appearance. Notice verse 11. He says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but be in silence. Now you have to go to verse 13 here. It says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. So he's drawing again, like we said before, to Genesis 3 and to Genesis 2, that relationship that exists already between men and women. He's drawing on creation to describe this. And to back up what he's saying, he says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Women should not distract with outbursts. He's talking about distractions in the congregation, and that's what this whole passage is about. Whether it's men or women, we do not to be, need to be a distraction in the congregation. What are we here to do? Worship God. And when we get in the way of that... We're getting in the way of a very important thing. A very important thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, a somewhat parallel passage to this. I want you to notice the language here as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26, he says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together... Each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. He says some of you want to sing a psalm, and some of you, and each one of you has a different psalm that they want to sing, and some of you want to give prophecy, or some of you want to interpret tongues, and some of you want to, want to speak in tongues, and some of you want to do whatever the case might be. He says, let it be done for edification. The purpose of our assembling is to worship God and to edify one another, and if there's chaos in the congregation... When you come together, there will be no edification. It will be a bunch of chaos. And so he says, verse 31, notice how he goes on. He says, for, for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. He says, take turns, people. Figure this nonsense out. And what would be the obvious argument against that? Well, I can't help myself. I've got the Spirit, right? I love that. I love that because then he goes on. He says, take turns. And we say, well, I can't take turns. I've got the Spirit and it's moving me to do this. And he says, verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. He says, don't sit there and say, well, I can't help myself. Because the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You can stop yourself from prophesying, or you can stop yourself from doing those things. And in verse 33, he says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as, is, uh, as in all the churches of the saints. This is the case because God is not the author of confusion. You say that you've got the spirit and you can't help yourself. Well, God must be the author of chaos then, because He's moving all of you to speak at the same time? No, that's nonsense. God wants that edification. He wants... He wants His name to be glorified and He wants you all to grow in your understanding and your relationship with one another. He's not going to push all of you to speak at once. That's nonsense. And so He puts that spirit in subjection to them, their ability to repress that, that need or that desire or that urge, whatever the case might be, in that respect. 
And so do we have that ability. We might have the urge to sing a psalm, and we might have the urge to, to read Scripture, and we might have the urge to bring a message from God's Word, or to pray, or whatever the case might be. But that spirit is able to be repressed for a time that we might take turns and make sure that the congregation is edified and God is glorified and chaos does not ensue. And while they might not have had the same organization that we do, where we have a list in the back that describes what people are doing and when they're doing it, for the most part, we are not so tied to that that if someone's not here, that job does not get filled. Especially like today. <laughs> But we do have organization. And while we might very well do it the same way for a number of years even, we are not tied to that. If someone decided, if, if the next song leader decided that they wanted to have three songs before the Lord's Supper, they could do that. And I would hope that no one in the congregation would be like, hey, that's not the way we've always done it. Because it's not in God's Word. It's not the two songs, a prayer, two more songs, the Lord's Supper, another song, and the sermon, and then another song for the invitation. That's not a God-given way of doing it. That's merely the way we've decided to do it for now. But the things that are important are the things that God has defined, that God has set in action, and He has described to us the way that it should be done. And that disturbances, those disturbances are what are most significant. Notice, if we keep going in verse 33, He's just said that God is not the author of confusion. That some men want to sing psalms and some men want to have prayers and some men want to do all these things and they should be in subjection to one another. Or they should take turns. And in verse 34, Let your women keep silent in, church, in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law also says. And if you look at verse 40, he sums up this whole matter in one verse. Even though this context goes from the beginning of chapter 14... And really, you can tie 1 Corinthians 11 in there as well, that they didn't have unity and oneness in the congregation. Verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. His whole point here, as well as the whole point of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, is about decency and in order. Not that we necessarily have a list and we're definitive about that list and we make sure that everything is done the way it's supposed to be done but that we make sure everything is done the way it's supposed to be done, the way God describes it to be accomplished. And when He leaves things up to, to us, we decide how many songs we lead, or how many songs we have before a, a prayer, and whatever the case might be. But the things that God has described, those are the things if we want to worship God in spirit and in truth, we have to do. We have to accomplish. And it doesn't matter what we think, or how we feel, or all the advancements that we consider the world to have made in women's rights and the ability for women or men to do whatever the case might be, if we want to worship God in spirit and in truth, we'll worship Him the way He describes. Or we won't be worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Because we'll be making ourselves gods. And we'll be deciding how God wants to be worshipped. And when we get into a situation like that, we are in serious trouble. We are in serious trouble. The same goes for so many things. We all have equality in the way that we all can come to God. We all have that ability to be children of God, to be heirs according to the promise, heirs of Abraham even, the father of our faith. But it comes from a willingness to submit to God. And that, my friends, is ultimately the problem. Folks do not want to submit to God. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter the reasonings that they have. If they are unwilling to submit to God, they're not going to be worshiping Him in spirit and in truth, and ultimately they're not going to be saved if they refuse to submit to God. If you have not submitted to God this day,